You can see movement and it's absolutely mesmerizing. Something's definitely happening with those faces. Let's suppose that the character is Medusa, right. is mouth the word, but what language would that be in? What would it sound like? Medusa. Medusa. This is going to be the film that I've always wanted to make for you. Remember this thing? This is an ancient gold artifact predating the Greek civilization. But when I saw the wee faces in the circle, they all looked different. Were they talking to us? Could they be animated? Well, that makes very little sense, Simon. <laughs> it was made thousands of years before the invention of cinema. But Jonathan Byrne, animation lecturer at Salford University, tried to animate it. What he revealed is fascinating and maybe changes history. We now think the central face is the mythical creature Medusa. And Medusa might be talking to us from her ancient grave. Medusa. Medusa. I was so excited, so I booked a Zoom call with Jonathan Byrne. I hope you're going to really enjoy as much as I did what we discussed, not only about the gold artifact, but about a novel concept that a lot of ancient art, cave art, sculpture, repeating patterns in Islamic art and gold artifacts are possibly animated. Hey everybody, guess who I have on the channel today? Johnny, and Johnny will introduce himself. Johnny is an animator and saw that amazing piece of possible animated ancient art, which I showed, which came first of all from Sutton Who, next to Rendlesham Forest, and then another piece, which is a circular shield, which I think was Greek. But um, hi, Johnny. Uh, tell hi. everybody who you are. Hi, my name is Johnny Byrne. Um, I'm an animation lecturer and researcher uh, based at Salford University in Manchester. So, yeah, that's me. I've Great. got a massive interest in all things animation, but particularly these ancient artifacts and ancient animation is one of my big passions. Oh, yeah. mine too. Mine too. It seems quite likely that, I mean, the root of the word animate is about bringing things to life. Um, it seems quite likely that we could have variations on making uh, inanimate art lifelike by movement or by the tricking the eye or persistence of vision, which is, of course, an amazingly interesting concept um, through many art. So, so let's first of all talk about what you did to this spinning disc, and then let's yeah. talk generally about how ancient art might be the word animated. So <laughs> you saw the YouTube film, and what, what did you do? Well, first of all, I was fascinated by this gold mm. object, this gold disc, and I noticed um, that it had like a repeating pattern on it, and I counted 12, and that immediately as an animator, I thought, oh, it's a magic animation number. Yeah. Um, what I did was, because uh, you'd mentioned about whether or not the, the differences in the faces might be discerned if right. it was to be animated. So um, the first thing I did, I took it into a photo imaging package, Photoshop, and I looked for concentricity. So I looked to see if it was symmetrical and how even it was. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't do is I didn't start correcting it because it's an ancient artifact. Mm -hmm. um, but I was absolutely blown away by how accurate, actually, uh, the impressions and the faces were on it. So, mm -hmm. you know, I overlaid it, fold them backwards and flipped it a few times. Um, and I ultimately cut it out and I right. took that in transparent layer over into an animation package, uh, which is Adobe After Effects. I don't know if I meant to say that. Yeah, but, definitely, um, definitely. Okay, yeah. so yeah, yeah, I took it over into After Effects and I then um, create, started to create a composition where the, the disc could rotate. Now, there was there was 12 different faces on there. Right. And I built the face of Medusa, which is fascinating. Mm. Mm. And um, I mean, I could have done some really technical uh, warping and a realignment and made it perfect but it's an ancient artifact like why why would you do that right so i ultimately started to rotate the disc every 30 or so degrees and i was lining up the eyes on the faces right. and the nose right every 30 or so degrees 
and I set keyframes in After Effects. And when I played it back, it just started to spin rapidly. And what I'd forgotten to do is to actually create what are called hold keyframes. Right. So the, the image essentially will rotate and snap. Yeah. Um, so I played with the timing, and if there's any animators watching this, yeah. initially the animation settings were set for every uh, one frame, uh, sorry, one second of footage, which is 24 frames. Right. Um, and I played with that, and I also played with it on 12 frames as well. Right, right. And the results were startling. So you started to see the disc move. I started to notice that there were things happening with those faces. There was yeah. an issue that was coming, which you're aware of, right? Which is relating to the original yeah. photography. Yeah. Um, because um, a high resolution scan or a mm. um, you know a photograph wasn't available of it, I couldn't um, find one. Um, you couldn't find one, and short of contacting the museum and, right. and asking, um, I ran the experiment with a low resolution image. But and you but you can see movement, and it's absolutely mesmerising. You see the disc yeah. unting because it's an old it's an old disc. You can see the. Faces are definitely something's definitely happening with those faces. Yeah, it could appear to be eye movements and lip movements. That's what I wondered. Yeah, because it seems like the the, the innermost face um, seemed mm. to um, pucker its lips, and then in a couple of times it it stuck out its tongue. The other two layers of faces, I wasn't sure if they were animated or moved. Exactly. Mm. I absolutely focused on the the, the larger face. Yeah. And um, it's interesting, isn't it? So let's suppose that that, that, that the, the character is, if you will, let's refer to it as a character, it's Medusa, right. is mouth the word. Uh, so we make mm. our mouth shapes, yow, right. make yeah. them the phonemes, so they're used in animation. Yes. It's really interesting to try and discern what they are. And to, to compound the, the, the mystery almost is, mm -hmm. let's imagine we've, we've figured out that it spoke a specific word. Fascinating. But what language would that be in? What would it sound like? To see the word, to see an animated uh, mouth movement, um, you would not only have to spin this artifact, which is quite possible. I mean, it might have a pivot like a top on the bottom, but you also <laughs> need to do this intermittent motion. This, you know, where uh, I wonder how the ancients did that. Of course, we in later years we had the zeotrope and various other, you know, kinetic early mm -hmm. cinema devices so you know, did the ancient were the ancients able to use this as a as an animated device who knows that is that's a fascinating question so there's quite a few ancient artifacts that people are supposed to be able to animate there's there's right. the vast holes um the late richard williams um yeah yeah yeah, yeah. He, he has an animation book that all the animated all the animation students um will pour over right. the animated book kit and in the front of that he describes uh, you know, Egyptian columns with repeating images on them. And as you ride past them on horseback, right. um, through the columns, you might perceive motion. With this disc, um, right. absolutely fascinating. Maybe there was a way, maybe using oil lamps or candles or even right. sunlight, maybe a shaft of light hitting a shaft one of, of the light. Lights. I remember as a child. There was a garden fence that was a that was um, flat, but with maybe a two millimeter gap. And when I ran home from school, I used to stare through the fence at the garden. And if there was somebody moving in the garden, I saw them as an animated. Car to me, it was just a cartoon character. And suddenly, I realized I was seeing, you know, getting persistence of motion from flickering. I went, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in this. So it's, it's, it's. So there's, so it doesn't have to be film or today video or computer. You can make a physical, um, mechanical, as you say, pillars, horses, light, flickering, uh, slats, uh, slit. Uh, yes. There's many ways to uh, bring something to life. Absolutely, the, um, you know, some of the more the early animation devices. Including the zoetrope, there's, yeah. there's a whole name of these, but there's a thomatrope, a praxinoscope. Yeah. But they typically use light and mirrors right. to reflect 
um, the images and they're, they're typically going to be set at angles so you get a kind of rolling shutter effect and right. that's kind of what you described when you were talking about uh, running past a fence as a child and looking through the slots yeah. you, you get that strobe effect which yeah. is fascinating incidentally i think i did a bit of that when i was of course a kid. you did because you're an animator johnny <laughs> very good things <laughs> of course you did yeah, yeah. yeah. Typical as filmmakers, but there's another there's a there's another whole aspect of bringing the inanimate to life, and that's mm. the um, just using uh, light. If I swing the light round, um, you can have um, a three dimensionality um, by altering lighting effects. And we live in Southwest France. <laughs> When, when I first moved here and saw famous cave art, when we live right next to Lascaux, which is a famous painted cave, um, yeah. I always thought cave art was flat, as I saw it in books, or as I saw it, you know, uh, on the Flintstones. <laughs> that was terrible, ba bad education. Reference, good animation reference. <laughs> it's a good reference for animation. But when we first went to the caves, the first thing that struck me was, oh, the caves aren't flat. They are, um, you know, they're 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 uneven surfaces, and that's great because the the painters augmented reality. So if there was a bump in the cave, it became the rump of a um, of a deer, and then they added legs and a head, and so they augmented the shape of the cave. But this is the, the other thing that struck me putting my. Uh, art school animation brain on was you move the light and you alter the shadows of the creature and so many this is people have never discussed this well not that i've read so many of the paintings have multiple legs or are repeat images so you get hmm, a deer with three heads or um, a bison with six legs. And I think it, using a flickering candle or a lighting effect, you could animate, uh, you know, a, a two-dimensional image. Have, have you seen any of that? I haven't seen that directly. I mean, I would love to see these. Oh, come images. and see it, yeah. right. South of France. Um, but I can, I can really grasp this idea of, uh, mm. so it's a uniform surface. What you've got is uh, the bumps and deformities in the right. rock. And they're a starting point for the artist. So, like you say, that the you know right, the, right. the of the animal. But what's fascinating is when you put a moving light across a bumpy surface, and we do this in computer graphics. We use a thing called uh, a normal map, which changes okay. the, the way uh, that light interacts with the surface. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I can imagine you'd get shadows falling in troughs. You'd get peaks illuminating. So you, there's a distinct chance by moving um, a, a lamp or a, a candle or right. some kind of light source across. Right. You definitely get the strobing effect and you know you don't really need um 60 frames a second to create an animation it can actually yep. be incredibly low frame rate in or order to get right. the illusion of moving yeah um, it seems so that that the, the the other big mystery about cave art is um why and it seems to be immediately if you think of these were animated, they were performance spaces. They were spaces of ritualistic demonstration where people who didn't do the art were invited into, and the art's always in the deepest, darkest back of the cave. It's never at the mouth. And you went in, the lights dimmed, you paid your two shillings at the door, and outside came the projectionist with a flickering oil lamp and showed you the creatures moving, and you went, ooh. <laughs> and you went, you know, I, 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 I'm sure it didn't happen like that, but they were modern humans, so maybe it was actually the Flintstone. <laughs> I mean, what you've described there isn't too far away from some of the, you know, the Victorian seances and magic lantern shows where people indeed really? did to go and see uh, apparitions and ghosts and things that were right. projected using magic lanterns. Uh, the Victorian parlor shows were phenomenal for this. But going back to the actual idea of the yeah. deepest, deepest recesses of a cave, yeah. and that being a place where it might be transformative, so rituals are about transformation. Mm -hmm. um, to be led mm -hmm. through there maybe as a rite of passage to be shown the animals in the area, 
right. what we celebrate. Um, and maybe right. it would have been kept for a precious few as well. Maybe it wouldn't have been yes. for everyone. The initiation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, those animated stories. Right. Well, the, the Victorians were very good at convincing their audiences that the magic lantern slideshows were real apparitions. They were moving living goats. Well, not right. living goats. Um, but could, I imagine the candle lit caves. There could have been something really magical there, you know, uh, oh, especially for right. your audience going through a rite of passage. Yeah. Uh, done something. And who makes things move? Well, it's the gods, isn't it? It's the gods. The gods. Right. The gods right. Things. It seems like the caves, the, it was a, could have been a kind of a, you know, an origin story of life. It, and it's also really fascinating, Johnny, why they only painted animals. There's almost no human representation in this art. But but I'm, I'm going to ask you a really interesting question. Do you okay. think Ooh. that you could use light effects or mirrors um, to actually uh, alter perception? I mean, is it possible? I mean, um, didn't hypnotists use, like, watch mm -hmm. my spinning mirror what do you know about using lights and mirrors to confuse? Yeah, I think there's definitely a case to be made for lights being made. Uh, how can I say this? Lights being used to right. uh, induce certain altered states. So oh. your classic hypnotist swinging the watch before your eyes. Right. That's doing a number of things. So one is it's a vocation, uh, sorry, a focal point. Right. But also it fatigues the, the eyes. Uh -huh. Your eyes are going to get heavy, the fatigued. Um, but I've got a background in uh, studying both magic and hypnosis, and there are some fascinating tales. Right. A um, couple of things. One is this process called photic driving, which is right. light frequencies at a certain frequency being able to govern the frequency of your brain so you can speed up or slow down the way that you perceive things. That's an altered state. Um, wow. But there's some absolutely fascinating historical cases. So there is a... A uh, French, a French neurologist, uh, Doctor Louis, I think how you pronounce his name. Yeah, and he discovered that with his test subjects, and this is all in the time of Mesmer, so Charles Mesmer, right, the great uh, hypnotist working with animal magnetism, right, um, discovered that by placing um, a mirror in front of someone's eyes, a rotating Ooh. mirror, Ooh. the flashes of light, the rays of the light would indeed very readily induce a trance and mm -hmm. if you think about what a trance state is it makes people massively suggestible right. dissolves and corrodes all of their critical faculties right and you can hallucinate right you can have positive hallucinations and negative ones as well right so could you imagine being in a trance state right. and then seeing some of these early devices like lit up or animating you'd absolutely um believe that they were real you know absolutely Oh, I think, oh, God, you have touched on so many interesting. I really want to talk to you about um, time perception being altered. But I mean, okay. I mean, but but um, the idea of dazzling, specifically mm -hmm. a good word. I mean, people use dazzle camouflage in 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 the navy to um to confuse our human limited perception you know if you saw a boat that was painted like a blue banana or black and white that broke up the shapes when you're in your submarine you didn't fire at it because you didn't know what it was isn't there a case where um lights and mirrors were used for camouflage do you know any stories about that yeah, so there's ah. a famous case, very famous case. There is a uh, a British illusionist stage performer called Jasper Masculine, and he was enlisted in the wartime by the British Army to use his skills of deception and his performance skills right. um, to, to to bolster the war effort. Um, mm -hmm. And this started off with, you know, he, he used to build inflatable tanks uh, and hide actual tanks under the garb of, trucks and so on so from right. the air it's very difficult to tell whether that was a real tank or a fake one and the right. idea was that the bombers would come and bomb the fake tanks the inflatable ones and not the real ones right, <laughs> um, right. But, right. but just his extension from that um he uh -huh. asked the pilots uh how would you identify an airfield to, to bomb it from from the sky right um well they look for the shadows on the ground, ah, Jasper right. Masculine's team were painting shadows. Right. Uh, but perhaps one of his most famous experiments, Jasper Masculine um, hid 
and moved the Suez Canal, which no. is an amazing feat. It's big. And it's, it's a big thing. How do you hide a canal? Right. Um, so this was done. It's a fascinating story, well worth looking into. Yes, um, please. Actually, turned off all of the lights around the original canal, mm -hmm. created somewhere several miles away, a distance away in the desert, similarish looking lights and landmarks, but also um, equipped a lot of military searchlights with what he called the whirling spray, which was basically a military searchlight that was aiming up to the sky with mirrors in a cone shape. And this thing would spin oh, right. by ginormous shafts of light all over the sky. And this really disorientated pilots. They couldn't get their bearing. They right. certainly couldn't strike targets. And I think he used multiple ones of these. Right. That's fascinating, yeah. Oh, what a great <laughs> idea. No, that would be completely confusing. And, yeah. I mean, the human, something that I'm very interested in, and the, one of the reasons that I looked originally at the shield was because of this strange incident that happened at Randlesham Forest, which was a where people encountered um, high-energy um, uh, effects and light. And one of the effects that they report um, is... Um, a, a how their perception of reality was altered and also their um, perception of passing time. T talk to me about how you could possibly alter um, time perception with animation uh, or devices. I, I think it, it's born, time perception is a really interesting thing. Uh, mm. Typically when we're absorbed in something, time can fly. Right. Um, if you know, we've all experienced time dilation in everyday life, but there are certain things that can make you right. experience the flighting of time. We've all experienced the idea of not having enough time to complete a task and rushing, and the clock seems like it's whooshing past. Yep. Um, and also, when you've got a really mundane, tedious task to do, the clock just drags, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I think with certainly with animation or flashing lights, there could be something in that that confuses the human faculty right. and, and enable you to track time as you normally would. So you might experience time dilation, right. slowing time. It you seems to me that time, we very much base our clock speed, our human clock speed on our natural rhythms of our body, say our heartbeat. And we, we, it's, it, it's, it seems, it seems obvious to me that how we measure time as humans is, is, is based on that. So in a time of, of high stress, uh, when our heartbeat increases, it's almost a bit like, I, I mean, I'm oversimplifying this, but could it be that the clock speed of your internal perception is, is increased because you're now perceiving the world at a higher frame rate? So things appear, and you know, higher frame rate means slower, you know, in the way that we perceive things. I don't know, it's, it's I had never thought, Johnny, Brilliant. it's you're a really in. interesting subject. Thank well, you. Your heart is pounding and your body is surging, and yeah. maybe you're in danger, um, right. or the sudden shock, and your heart kicks into that. Right. Absolutely. Capturing more beats per second and changing the time base of the body. Right. And indeed, I think there's a, there's a case there for it changing your perception of time. There are stories of people having, um, you know, accidents, falling off a bike, for example, and right, seeing right. things in slow motion as yes. you tumble onto yeah. the pavement. Um, I've certainly experienced that, and that's oh, yeah. a fascinating yeah. faculty, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We all have, you know, time stood still as as I crashed into the tree. You know, okay. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, no, that, the tree that's... tree on me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, that's the... Oh, this is such a great conversation. I mean, the other thing that I've knocked on about on my YouTube channel is mm -hmm. just imagine that extraterrestrials worked on a different time base. I remember seeing a, a comic, you know, in the kind of, um, you know, Marvel comic specials of my childhood where uh, aliens came and they moved so fast that nobody could see them. They were just a ghost or a blur or the, the corollary, the opposite of that is, is imagine the aliens came and they were like a rock 
and they are alive, but they're a mountain, and we don't. Pres we in our fleeting, our very human time base, we are either something too fast or too slow. We don't perceive. It's really fascinating. You should say that there is an animation, um, and forgive me. I saw this a couple of decades ago, and it is about um, right. some rock people living on a hill. Uh -huh. and they are moving at a totally different time base, so everything around them is is in, is in a really really fast kind of like mix, chaotic mix. Right. And there's a really funny moment where these rock people are trying to establish themselves on this hillside, and one of them Hello. picks up an acorn and throws it at the other rock, and instantly a tree sprouts up because their time base is totally different um there's also a brilliant episode of uh huey louis and dewey oh yeah Duck Tales, yeah in which they have a stopwatch called the time teaser where they can press this stopwatch they change the time rate and so essentially they can whiz past everybody everyone else appears to be frozen and they can go and do play pranks and that sort of thing thing and then they can essentially unfreeze time oh. but in terms of terrestrials the technology that might be involved there the exotic physics involved who knows they might have the ability to move uh, 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 brilliant, brilliant. right now <laughs> they do no i don't know that's something that we're very much looking at can you imagine johnny imagine if you could have a local time stopwatch like an animated cartoon and go click while you're in a tank and drive off and everybody else <laughs> perceives you over there but you bug off <laughs> <laughs> in the blink of an eye you would seemingly yeah, yeah. To see it out of well you'd, i think the expression is phasing out or winking out of reality and the reality is maybe they've just moved at a different frame rate and they're over there now and they've got you <laughs> frame rate i love the frame, term rate. frame rate clock speed and then the other thing that you just said is in the blink of an eye because eye blinking is an actual if you i can see behind you that you do uh cell animation as well as computer and uh and 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 moving animation kinetic animation whatever you call it um but have you ever if you checked animation by blinking by blinking, fascinating. Um, I mean, we've all done the thing with the the piece of paper on the edge of the notebook. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's essentially creating a, a shutter. What's fascinating about blinking and its link to animation is the cicading of the eyes. That is when your eyes flick from one subject to another. Ah. Can totally be hijacked by magicians. Magicians can absolutely use the cicading of your eyes. You're essentially blind as your eyes flick from one place to the other. Your brain cuts out the information between on the cicade, which is fascinating. And it's actually part of that process, although it's slightly different, that makes animation happen. It's the persistence of vision. So, oh, I can see there's a there's a trick here. <laughs> no, there um, isn't. But no, I, I'm getting cool. you. So if you distract yeah. somebody, we go cloth yeah, and, and, and then you... Uh, you you substitute it. The the I di I'm not a magician, but I mean that's what you're saying. You can the bit between we don't process, we don't bother processing. We that's we it. lock on to one thing and then we can substitute it. Absolutely, and that Whoa. process it's really super freaky, and it is used in editing as well. If you look at a, a, cin a cinema screen, when there's a hard cut, which means you have to re-register your focus of attention from a face to another object, right. it's you really feel that it, it jars on you. But when there's what's called a soft cut, the area of the screen where the focus is, when it cuts, if there's another interesting thing there, yeah. your eye doesn't have to move, and you, it's 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 an invisible cut. And magicians do absolutely hijack this. There is um, ah. a magician who uses, who used to be an editor and uses no. some of these techniques to create a process called choreographic misdirection. I feel like I need to produce some kind of hat now and a rabbit, but I haven't got one with me. <laughs> well, next, next time we chat, bring the rabbit. I'll bring the rabbit. <laughs> oh, th th this is really fascinating. You have, 
Yanni, today you've touched on so many interesting subjects. I'm not quite sure whether that original gold disc is that animated. I mean, somebody, mm -hmm. I, I have very, very wonderful support from Patreon. Thank you, patrons. Yes. And one of one of the patrons who's wonderfully dry humor, he said, uh, it was probably just they carved it wrong. I went, no. I I think it is a Medusa's face, and there's definitely at least one frame where the Medusa sticks their tongue out, and the rest could be just badly cut, you know. But it's obviously it, some kind of pressed metal. But I think it's talking. I, I'd really like to believe that it's telling us something, or it's at least uh, hexing um, somebody, or something like that, or it's giving Hex. some kind of warning. Yeah. Hex. <laughs> you but, have touched on so many interesting things you will get inundated with questions from my viewers and i've got likely. yeah you definitely and i've got more <laughs> questions so can can we come back and chat more in the future absolutely yeah oh, thank you like, yeah, all right no all right. Well, th thanks a lot for today. Um, no problem. Um, I will share this with viewers, and they're going to be really interested, not only in the disc, but also so many of the fascinating concepts that you've mentioned about human perception, time, and other possibilities of animating ancient artifacts. Yes. Mm -hmm. I love yes. it. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Simon. It's been great. And uh, take care. All right. Oh, that was a really interesting chat. Johnny touched on so many different subjects, pulling rabbits out of a hat, Victorian parlor games, the man who moves the Suez Canal, and of course, the concept that ancient art can be brought to life, animated. Please send me your questions so you and I can get back to him with follow-up questions. This is exactly what I've always wanted to do with this humble YouTube channel. Hear from you who know more information than I do and share it with the YouTube audience. Truly today, the truth was out there. Thanks for watching. If you like this film, give it a thumbs up, subscribe for more and see you next time.